YouTube's got to go live button. Hi, everybody. Yeah, you know, I don't know if it's our brand or not to do the dogs. But like. How do you not? How do you not click that button when it's got a dog? <laughs> it's there go. just as good as it was last week. It's still very good. It's still very topical on brand. Uh, hi, Darius. Happy Friday. And also hi to you, Dylan. Uh, happy Friday to you as well. Or it's not even Friday. It's Thursday. So uh, whatever. Hey, happy, Thursday. Day, happy day to you. Um, welcome. Welcome to the Mux livest of live shows where today we have a fun one. We are going to be auto-generating thumbnails uh let's just look at this beauty that we came up with here this is programmatically generated with some code just from a mux upload and we use a pipe dream workflow so pipe dream is a tool that uh we'll be talking about today that uh dylan is representing and we'll learn a little bit more about what pipe dream is how we can use it together with mux and video uploads in mux using the transcript to kind of like piece together all of these little doodads to generate uh this beautiful this beautiful thumbnail image uh if you don't want to click on that you know i don't know what you'll want to click on this guy looking pretty good in that thumbnail um, a million views first day right at there. least at least uh so dylan welcome thanks for joining us you know i was i thought i would open this up just like a little bit talking about like why thumbnails are important and maybe not too not too much of a deep dive here but i did watch i did watch a 45 minute video with the algorithm person todd at youtube um being interviewed with the mr beast thumbnail designer named chucky um and th so these are like the two people that know about thumbnails todd's like kind of like biting his tongue i think about algorithm uh secrets that whole time and chucky is not wanting to share too too much about why mr beast thumbnails are just like absolutely crushing it all the time but there was so much information in that that like i just wanted to kind of break down a little bit i think we should first share that that link too in the description but to that video because it's an incredible video um but kind of break down some of the lessons that they were talking about in that video about why thumbnails for video is important and how you can kind of like reduce the time to production for some of these thumbnails. Um, but the first thing that I thought was really interesting, like we see this all the time is these, these are faces in the thumbnails. Uh, Darius, what do you think that that impacts the ranking of the, this is kind of a quiz question. Do you think that impacts the ranking of a video? Uh, by the algorithm? I really want to believe it doesn't just because it's almost like a meme at this point, like the YouTuber with like the, the shocked face or whatever. Um, but at the same time, like it's a trend because it probably does something. I don't know how much it does. Maybe YouTubers don't know how much it does, but you know, they have a B testing tools available to them. They try different thumbnails and those are the ones that succeed for whatever reason. I they've got to, Dylan, do you guys make thumbnails over there for your videos that you're creating at Pipe Dream as well? Um, what do those end up looking like? Do they include faces? Do they have do you have any kind of strategy or thought behind what ends up in your thumbnail? Yeah, we had a template that we reused for uh, in the beginning of all our videos, uh, and then we started switching to this theme of Open AI or sorry, Mid Journey generated images with a specific theme in mind. It's like seasonal plus something fun related to the video. Um, but I'd be curious to try both. I mean, using this technique that we're gonna go over in this this uh, stream, the, combining both a real live video plus a background generated from from AI or some other source. So here's here's what's interesting about both those is that, uh, and this is true that for a lot of what happens, you know, in in created in creative uh, endeavors or like it's it's working for one person. Somebody sees that and sort of like hooks onto it and thinks that that is the thing that's going to impact or take your viewership up. But what I learned in that interview is that the algorithm does not count or well, supposedly does not count or know or care if there is a face or two faces or anything like that in a thumbnail. Um, but 
I guess related to that is that it notices that some people respond more to thumbnails with faces in it. And it's just part of how we as humans interact with the thumbnails and the pictures and the, the people that we can sort of identify in these thumbnails. But what I thought was really interesting that, that Todd had mentioned was really it might actually work against you to include your face in the thumbnail if nobody knows who you are. And maybe like that is part of that identification over and over. You keep seeing this face pop up and eventually people know who you are. But the reason why it works for Mr. Beast and team is because like it's such a ubiquitous face that now it's kind of like you see that face and you want to continue to click on it. But there, there might be a better connection that you can do in your thumbnail kind of tie your video content um, closer together and kind of what uh, Mr. Beast and Chucky were calling secure the click. Or in other words, like design that thumbnail in a way that actually matches what your target audience is really looking for. Maybe for programming, it's not faces. Like maybe it's actually like screenshots of code or, you know, I don't, I don't know, some sort of like visuals that make a little bit more sense to a programmer. Um, but it doesn't necessarily actually have to do with any one trend. Um, and what I just thought was interesting was that in that particular, without going too much uh, further in the Mr. B strategy, what was working was like they were trying 50 different designs for a thumbnail and then ultimately kind of whittled down to what ends up working. So ultimately, there's a lot of testing and who really knows like what the actual answer is for what thumbnail is going to work. Um, but the advice was always to like, hey, look at what your competition is doing. Look at uh, if you go to your audience tab on YouTube, look at what other recommended videos that you're being recommended and what sort of thumbnails they're using that might be good inspiration for your content. So anyway, I just thought it was an incredibly interesting video. Um, so we should link to it. And, uh, maybe draw some inspiration from it for today's exercise, which is how can we remove kind of that slog or like instead of having to have, I hope Rob's not watching because Rob's our, our in-house expert designer, but um, instead of having a design uh, person that come in and have to create a canvas for every single video that your users or you are uploading to a, a service like Mux, how can we sort of automate that? So took some time over the past couple of days to kind of come up with a workflow using pipe dream to see if we can make that happen. Um, and I, this isn't something that's entirely brand new over at, at last year. It's about a year ago. I wrote this blog post about auto generating a content strategy using some of these AI creation tools that we've kind of been exposed to and numb to here for the last, you know, few years. And at the time, these were the kinds of thumbnails that it was generating based off of, the transcript of the video. Uh, so I would take a Mux uploaded video, send the transcript that Mux generates for that video over to, I think this was maybe a Dolly, yeah, Dolly uh, API. And it would come up with these. And these aren't great, let's, let's be honest. Nobody's gonna actually show these thumbnails as part of you know, what, what they're gonna feel comfortable associating with their video content. But I started thinking more of like, is there more that we can do here to kind of, associate um, our, our video content and have a little more control over it. So we're not just leaving it up to the robots to decide what our video content end up looking like. And I think we came up with something kind of fun here and kind of interesting. So let's see what we come up with. Um, so here I, I have a video I've already uploaded to Mux. And this is me. Uh, this is probably a year ago. I had, I had that longer facial hair. Now I'm looking like a baby again, but um, we're, we're seeing these web hooks fire off Every time that you upload a video to Mux, you can see that there's an asset created webhook, asset ready. And then there's also these track ready events as well that if you are enabling auto-generated captions for the videos that you're uploading, you'll be able to get an update uh, event as well that just says like, hey, this, this captions have been generated. Everything's ready to go. So you can click in here and see for this particular video, we have some IDs associated with this webhook that would get sent out to the destination server that you choose and notify the server that you know things are ready to go. So I just thought, what if we took this information in that transcript and sort of played around with it in a pipe dream workflow to see what we can come up with? And D Dylan mentioned to me uh, that, that really pipe dream is a great place to prototype with this kind of stuff. So for folks, that don't really know what Pipe Dream is at all, Dylan. Maybe you could just introduce Pipe Dream, the product, and, and what it's what it's all about. 
Yeah, that's a that's a great way of putting it. So it's really the platform for just running code, arbitrary code, but it also bootstraps your authentication, whether it be API keys or OAuth based. And on top of that, it runs in a serverless platform. So you have to worry about scale. It's all handled for you. Uh, it's really the quickest way to go from prototype to production without even touching your local IDE whatsoever. There's no context switching. There's no worrying about a uh, test suite. It's all just built right into the the web UI, which Dave's going to go over. And uh, it's really kind of a miraculous product. Uh, you can run Node, Python, even Go or Bash. Uh, and use pre-built steps or jump into code, whatever you need to. It's very flexible. Dar, I was going to ask if you thought about like everything we've been talking about, or I've been talking about, I guess I was rambling there for a minute for, for um, thinking about how a workflow like this might actually proceed. How would you like think to tackle that as a problem space? Or how would you try to solve um, for that this auto-generated pipeline? Auto-generated? I mean... <sighs> I spent the morning in GitHub Actions, so I feel like any workflow that I propose might have kind of what what I want to call the GitHub Act. GitHub probably doesn't want me to call it the GitHub Actions problem, which is that I'd probably write some code on my computer and then deploy it to whatever GitHub, and then have my CI/CD pipeline like go ahead and deploy that to serverless functions and everything. And I'd probably have this honestly like painful iteration cycle of like developing locally, testing locally, deploying it to production, and then oh, you know, it doesn't. <laughs> doesn't work in production. Uh, so, I mean, I would probably, yeah, probably write like an API endpoint or something um, that Mux would hit. And then I'd have that API endpoint like output an image somehow, like maybe some sort of like HTML to PNG something or other. And then, and then how does that image get to me, right? I guess I could go to a web page and like download it there, but then that requires like a manual step. So like, you know, I'm kind of missing that like last step of automation. Do I like add some sort of Slack integration? Um, yeah, there's a lot of moving parts here. I get the feeling that I'm going to be really happy with whatever whatever Pipe Dream has to has to mix up this formula. Yeah, I kind of think that way too. Like locally would run a script, but then not really sure what happens in the middle or like have any sort of visibility or observability in the steps or retries or things like that. It would always just be just me mashing my mm -hmm. like. No, like run node again locally and see what see if it works. So yeah. uh, this was a lot of manually too, with. right? And don't forget the ngrok tunnel for that oh webhook to arrive. <laughs> That's oh, right. Yeah. Oh, gotta exactly. restart the server every single time I make a change. Uh where's no demon or no daemon? How do you pronounce that? No, no daemon. Set that great. up again. How do whatever I do it that? is? I type it too often. Yeah, yeah, you know what I'm talking about. All right, so we got to jump in here because we got uh, a lot of steps to write and come up with. But the first and most important thing that we need first is reaction photos for all of us. So I'm going to have Dylan, you're, you got to take some screenshots of us and we're going to do just, just this one live. So let's go. I'm going to go full screen on me here first and uh, take my photo. All right, three, two, one. Beauty. How do I look? I got that. Okay, good. It's uh, Dar, good reaction. Next. Kind of like the James Bond. Oh, with the coffee mug. I dig it. With the three, two, one. With the mug. With so the, mug. the other part was that that I thought was interesting was that the uh, the mouth open. Take your you could take yours, Dylan, too. The mouth open and whoops, the mouth closed in the in Mr. Beast videos was A B tested across 30 different videos. And all 30 videos that had associated a thumbnail with the mouth closed were winners of that A-B test. So they were like not sure that that was actually a thing until that process completed. And they were like, all right, I guess we're just closing our mouth from now on. But um, all right, so we we will see if we can use those in our final <laughs> creation here. But let's, let's see what we come up with. So I'm over here in Pipe Dream. Cool. This is a cool area to just create a new workflow or tell me, tell me what is the, the resource? Is that, is this the workflow area, Dylan? Yeah, exactly. So resources, uh, they could be workflows. In the future, they will be sources, which is another topic. Uh, you can see them in the far left nav. There's this thing called sources. It's a different type of serverless function that's designed to trigger your workflow specifically. So they could be like iterating over a REST API and doing that deduplication for you. Like, you know, those before webhooks, it did pull an API and like grab records manually. That's what sources are really good at. 
They can also just emit webhooks as well, or accept webhooks. Uh, that's a, a different topic for another day. But in the Got future, it. just just know that it's workflows now. But in the future, it'll be more uh, more types of well resources. All right, so we're going in here with a new workflow. It looks like we have some controls over like how long can we allow this thing to run, some memory controls, retries, maybe some additional uh, concurrency settings and whatnot. So a lot, lot I'm already seeing here, but I'm just gonna go in with the default settings. And let's think about this whole flow from like top to bottom. First thing, we mentioned this briefly, but Mux will send off events when it sees, hey, there's a new video uploaded or hey, that, that video that you just uploaded has a text track or transcript that has been automatically generated and it's ready to go. So we need to be notified of that event and that's how we use uh, webhooks, right? But instead of having to do that within, like you said, Dylan, and, and set up a local tunnel or uh, have a, some kind of production ready endpoint, we can just create a new recipient basically on demand here for that webhook. So I'm just going to configure this trigger, right? We have full HTTP requests. Um, there's really not much I have to change here. It looks like maybe you could, like I could change my domain name that the webhook is going to be on. Is that right? Yeah, exactly. Just... So you can set up a custom domain so that you have a, um, you know, like a subdomain that's associated with your your brand. Um, but by default, you just get this nice unique URL that's only unique to this workflow. It triggers only this workflow. All right. So this is basically where we would set the webhook to be delivered, right? So we have this public URL, looks unique, it's ready to go. Um, and I am, if I'm looking again at this track ready, we see the event here. So instead of actually uploading a video on the stream here, I'm just gonna paste in an example um, webhook payload right in here. So it's the same one that you would see over here, but I just don't wanna go through the upload process. So we see video asset track ready, gets sent to this webhook and we would configure this webhook in the MUX dashboard under the webhook setting in the sidebar. So uh, let's just say send HTTP request. And this is just kind of mocking that request being sent to that endpoint, it says it's ready to go. And look, it's starting to get wrapped in like some pipe dream code here. So now we're seeing this step, the step called trigger, which is our default name up here, had uh, uh, an event that was fired and here's some of the contents of that event. Well, we got wrapped with a lot of different information here that we have access to. Uh, interesting, okay, so what we need to do from the MUX side of things is exchange this webhook. We have the asset ID in this payload from the track that was sent over, but we don't have the playback ID for, for the asset over on MUX. And one of the things that, uh, we'll have to do here is exchange or go fetch this asset basically by sending another API request out to Mux to get that playback ID. And so we're going to use the playback ID because we need information, uh, the visual information about the video, and we'll get there um, related to, uh, well, I don't want to find spoilers here. So we need to get that playback ID first. Let's just add another step. And I mean, I'm not a genius, but this plus is looking pretty good for that. There we go. <laughs> That's right. Okay, cool. So these can like talk to each other. And now this next step, what what all are we seeing here? Uh, what what's, what are these available options all about? Yeah. So this this is where you get into the nitty gritty. So by uh, out of the box, PipeDream already integ integrates with two thousand plus apps. So you can connect your OpenAI account. You can connect your Google Drive account, and it's very very simple to get connected to PipeDream and start using pre built actions. But you can also do things like use Node.js code or Python like you see there. And you could still use those same connected accounts at the code level, which hopefully we get to show you. Um, but yeah, it's 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 really, the doors, this is just a small panel, but it's hiding behind it thousands and thousands of APIs that you can integrate with. Okay, well, uh, seems like a, yeah, like you said, like a little sneak preview of maybe what you can do here, but. Um, mm -hmm. What we need to do is talk to Mux. You, uh, so look, there's if I type in Mux here, oh, I even get a little Mux app. How about that? So good. So we need to use this. This is going to give you some of these different actions, right? That can integrate easily with the Mux API without having to write any code. Yeah, and these are open source too. So uh, there, you could fork the entire PipeDream repository 
and modify this particular action, to publish it to your own account or contribute it back to the, the main repository so it's public for everyone to use. Uh, yeah, so you can even publish your own custom ones if you want to dry up your workflows a little bit. Uh, so how do we how do we get the asset ID in here from the trigger that was sent in that previous event? Yeah, so what you can do, you can see how it says select an option or enter a custom expression. That's kind of like your what we call the uh, the field, the prop field, and it'll that that explorer you'd see will allow you to search through your options. So did you select an event at the top there? I think you did. Yeah. Okay. Great. So here you can search you the variables um, that are exported from your triggers anything above this step you can see it says steps triggers and namespace and you could look through your data manually or you can use that search bar where it says search variables and scope just quickly find a particular attribute that you need to play oh, into see. this okay. asset param yeah so, so you just search for asset yeah oh. and then it's easiest to set like to click a path now the really cool thing about this is you could put in static like text into the prop field. So if you wanted to give like a static asset ID for some reason, you could. But those double curly brackets are just JavaScript evaluation. So that is referencing the variable steps.trigger.event.body.data.asset ID. And you could do things like lower casing, upper casing, mapping, filtering. I mean, anything we can do in JavaScript, you can perform between those two curly brackets. But for passing data, it's probably right in line up here. Normal just like thing. This will execute. Yeah. JavaScript there? Oh, yeah. Yeah. If you wanted to say like dot to lowercase, it'll perform the two lowercase function against that that data. Yeah. Wild. I um I connected our Mux account so I didn't have to fiddle around with any sort of API keys. Seems to be like the trend. We still gotta figure out in streaming and screen recording <laughs> how to not expose API keys and, and secrets, but uh, for now, I'll pre I pre-connected a, a Mux account up here, and I just what did I click? I don't even remember. Test, and it it did it. It did the thing that I was hoping for it to do, which was uh, <laughs> grab the it's too asset. Fast. It's too fast, I guess. Uh, and we have the playback ID in here, so this is just a generic Mux API response. Not not really a first asset. Yeah. Um, not nothing too fancy that happened there. Um, and I want to make sure. To kind of stay organized, I noticed before when I was playing with it that I like to rename these steps so I can easily, when I look back, like we we call it up here, trigger. I want to make sure that when I use these in the future that I can like think easily about where did I get that mux asset from? Oh yeah, clearly it was like that. It was that stuff that's like, get mux asset. All right, so playback ID. Now that we have the playback ID, here's, here's the first spot that this is going to come in handy. Darius, you following me so far? Totally on board. I'm okay. enamored so far. All right. So let's <laughs> see. Keep going. going. We have we have a docs uh here, a doc here to retrieve the transcript. So look, here here's where first of all, we need that playback ID. Is that I mean, you, this is just a simple get request that you would make. Um so this is a public URL because we have a public playback ID associated with that video, which means anybody can access it. Uh, and it also has a track ID here so we need to basically swap these two out with the actual values that are that we're looking to work with here so i'm gonna go back over here uh i'm getting a warning what's this all about dylan yeah so when you change what's called the namespace of a step or just the name of a step you notice how um if you reopen the get mux asset uh results panel you can see how at the very top of the panel it says steps .get asset. well you renamed it to steps .mux get mux asset oh, right so yeah. now it's just out of date so it's trying to tell you hey um most likely you're working downstream off of data that's changed so you might as well retest to re-export or re-perform that that api call get the latest uh make sure it's mapped it. correctly to the name that you created oh i yeah. see okay so now, so now it's now renamed we're seeing get mux asset yeah. there okay so if i go next step would be let's add another step here and i just want to send a basic request to that URL and I copied the format of it. So I have it right here. Stream on Mux.com. We need the playback ID. We need the text, the track ID. All right. So I'm going to swap this out. And is it, uh, I probably could just search for it again here, right? Playback, playback. Cool. So I can hit select path. 
And this is going to get a little long. I might break your, I might break your UI here. <laughs> Let's see, track ID. Uh, I'm going to delete that. And I also need, this is going to come from, this is going to come from the asset as well. All right, so I can get get Mux, Mux asset. We have the audio track, the video track, and the text track. And here's the track ID all the way at the bottom. So whoop. Oh yeah, we're way off screen there. Um, all right, so this one, like I said, is public. We don't need to authorize uh, or authenticate the call at all. So I can hit test. And I think we're working with, yeah, this is again, my my day video over here in the, uh, over here in the Mux dashboard. So I talk in this video, this is a clipping video. It talks about how to clip with the Mux API. Um, and you can kind of see the transcript here that shows you exactly what I'm talking about in this video. Yeah. Uh, can you imagine trying to console.log that in a node script and trying to read it in your, you know, like it's just kind of nice to just have the export ready in there. Well, I mean, what, I, yeah, I think what I like here is like, so far being able to just separate these even visually like i know mentally a lot of times what i'll do is just kind of like write the code file and then comment all the different steps that i need to do um, but being able to kind of break those out into different blocks and then have all the ability to like do the retries or see what went wrong in that step is kind of nice uh, in terms of prototyping anyhow so um all right so now we need to generate let me go back to this this is what we we're trying to go for here right this this uh beautiful uh canvas and I needed to come up with a summary of that transcript and have it to be the most click worthy thing uh, that you could read that shows up in your thumbnail. And again, like you have to think about like, what is your objective here? For me, it's to get a million views on YouTube, but for you, it might be like, um, this thumbnail is gonna show up in an email and you wanna put a play button on there, or you wanna even maybe the duration of the video in, in here as well, that helps to encourage the person that's just checking their email, like, oh, maybe I should watch. Maybe, oh, first of all, this is a video if there's a play icon on it. And maybe I have the time to watch it if there's a duration of, you know, 30 seconds or something like that. Um, so think about that as we kind of compose what we're trying to do here, come up with a amazing text to accommodate uh, and accompany the, uh, the video, right? So next step that we're looking to do here, first of all, I want to rename this again, like I mentioned, this one was going to be get transcript, right? So I'll just type that in here, get transcript. And I'll test to kind of reload that warning. Number four here, we have, let's get the text for that thumbnail. So I'm gonna add another one and use the API that, Daria, did you say that before? I was gonna say that everybody's used, but I don't know, I don't know if that's true or not. This is the I open mean, AI chat uh, response. Completions, maybe, is what they call it. This is awesome. I'm used in to some way. Box. This is like a great case for the API. All right. So in some way, everybody's got some interaction on this thing. But here's here. I have a pre-written prompt, just so we don't have to watch me make a million typos on here. So we're gonna make a call to the OpenAI ChatGPT uh, endpoint. Here. And what's it doing? So this is basically, okay, I'll summarize what this paragraph is all about. You can read it on your side. But what we're saying is, uh, hey, you're amazing at writing and coming up with these titles that appear on the thumbnail that will secure the click, that will get somebody interested enough to wonder about what's going on in this video and want to learn more. And what I learned too about the, the um, tutorial video that I watched, or that interview that I watched earlier that I was talking about, is that you generally like don't always want to use the same text as the title of your video in the thumbnail as well. Um, it should be kind of complementary, like a whole package that really like brings the visuals plus that intriguing text plus the title of the video together to make uh, to secure that click, like uh, like Chucky was talking about. So um, here's what we're trying to do here: is basically like, hey, give me read this this um, transcript and give me the moment where something happens that you think you could package up into a memorable or clickworthy worthy title. Uh, no guarantees here, that's the thing, right? It's with all these like AI tools that we're gonna come up with something amazing, but uh, either way, this is good for, for prototyping and experimenting here. So we're gonna generate this, I'm gonna type, rename this again. So we wanna call this like get thumbnail text. 
cool. And we, we have all these fields down here too. So this seems like what this API call would maybe accept, Dylan, is that right? Exactly. So these are basically, you can think of them as like the optional uh, parameters for an API call. Um, and they're just formatted nicely in the UI uh, as like these, they're called optional props, but we call each one of these fields a prop. All right, so I don't think I need to change any of these for this step. So I'm going to hit test, and I already authenticated my same deal here, authenticated my OpenAI account. And uh, let's see what it came up with here. <laughs> Trim video is fast with Mark's <laughs> fast. Uh, amazing. OK, uh, look, that's succinct, and it's to the point. I actually, I out of what I would imagine this thing could maybe write, like, that's not the worst uh thing that i wouldn't want to like appear in a thumbnail uh my other asterisk is like i don't think i would auto publish a thumbnail right now that's auto generated but i would um like get a get a sprite sheet of some kind and be able to review all the different options that are available like what if this thing made like 10 or 20 or something like that and there could be something good in there so uh anyway i'm gonna stick with this one i like that trim videos fast with mux api um, all right so here is What's the next step? We need to um, we need to get who is actually in this video, right? Because if we're going to build this out, we need to learn somehow who the actual person in this video is, so we can apply this. Depending on how you look at it, either cringe, <laughs> cringe person subject overlay, or helpful, meaningful, and effective person overlay. Um, and apply it to this ultimate canvas that we're building. So we need some way to detect that. There's uh, Darius, how would how would you think of ways that we can understand who's in the video with Mux? <laughs> with Mux. Uh, I mean, th that's the thing. Like Mux, no matter what, like we can get thumbnails out, which is gonna be great, or we can like maybe get the entire like storyboard, which is a couple frames from the entire video. But then like actual person detection, then we've got to kick it off to some other surface. Um and and for there, like what service off the top of my head can do person extraction like you could probably build some custom workflow with like image magic or something like that but now we're getting real weedsy and i would start looking for an api and i get the feeling that you've got something in mind i do have something in mind you overthought it though you know what when i was thinking about this too i first started with pass through like when you upload a video you could potentially depending mm -hmm. on where you come from like a cms you could tag that video with like, like who's this who what user uploaded this and if it's dave's user then i know dave's in the video right so like there are i guess there's some ways that we can tag or like understand who's in there without getting too experimental about it or including too many servers but also that wouldn't make for extremely compelling live stream content so we have to of course it up to the robots to figure out who who is in uh who's in this video so um and you mentioned it actually during your guess is we have these these storyboards right so these storyboards give you a peek at what's going on in the video throughout the length of that video so it'll kind of like pick different frames over a time span of that that video and render it all to a single image so you get a little preview here and just these are often used in a player when you're kind of hovering over that bottom timeline we can see it's switching between the different positions on that on that sprite sheet um that is really cool i've never seen that before but yeah, so this is a way that it's kind of like it's one image and then it's based off of uh, a manifest. It tells you, hey, at that specific time of the video, this is actually the, the contents of that video. So it'll kind of move that spread around in this box and show a particular um, chunk of the video or that frame that's in the that's happening in that area. So it's like listening really to neat. podcasts on two and a half speed, but visually. <laughs> Exactly, it kind of like lets you jump ahead and, and identify those moments. Um, so it's one way you can use a sprite sheet, but we here, we're gonna get a little wild too. We're gonna we use, I don't know if, it, can I say get wild when it comes to programming? Sure, why not, like cowboy style. <laughs> um, we got get thumbnail text, and now we need to get the subject. So so I didn't share this yet about, um, I should go to a new new tab, but one area of as well that I was uh, uncovering is this file store. What's this all about? Yeah, so the file store you can think of just like as batteries included object file storage. Um, think like a uh, Google Drive or Dropbox or AWS S3 
it's simple object storage that you can easily access within your workflows with code um, and not have to worry about authentication, setting up AIM profiles, all the uh, hassle when it comes to integrating with a dedicated file storage system. It's just built right into Pipedream. So it's kind of, it just feels like a bucket. Like I could just throw whatever I need to work with up here and maybe reference it throughout the code I'm writing. Is that right? Exactly. You can even upload from the dashboard. So you don't have to write a specific like piece of code just to upload a single file. You can go to your dashboard and manage the files through here and then programmatically um, interface with them with the uh, with the workflow. I, I use it for um, sending recap emails after live streams. So I'll just go to Calendly and download the CSV, extract all the emails, and then send them an, uh, you know, a thank you email for joining. And here's a link to the, the recap of the live stream. Just one example. We're getting we're getting some hints here of some pieces. Some things have been happening in the background, but uh, just to kind of break down so we don't feel like we're cheating too much here. There's a couple of items that are in this file store that I preloaded. One of this is there's a font. Um, seeing some peculiar names here of some PNG <laughs> images. Um, but the one I want to start with here is this labels, and this is something I pre baked. Uh, look, it's us. It's Dave, it's Dylan, <laughs> and it's Dar. These are our profile pictures. And I, this is something I was just kind of playing around with to see if this would actually work. So we're going to use this file from the file store and uh, use it in our workflow here. So what we need to do is uh, we talked about the storyboard. We talked about the label. We got to tie we got to tie those both together. So here's what where this like whole pipe dream kind of prototype workflow thing got really powerful for me when I was playing around with it was you could also just write custom code. Like if you wanted to interject anything that was maybe there's not a pre-built app for it or, you know, I just needed a little more control over it. I could just come in here and just write whatever I want. Question mark. Is there, is there, is there restrictions to this Dylan or what? What is this? No, you can, yeah, you can even import packages. Um, like there's there's a commented out section on line two there, import Axios, just yep. import it. it. There's no CLI command to worry about or package.json to manage. It just imports it. It's kind of magic. Um, and you can access all the same exact data from just like you do with the pre. There's no uh, restrictions when you're using code versus a pre-built action. In fact, the pre-built action under the hood looks like this code, which is wild. Um, Interesting. So yeah, it's it's the same. All right, so I have, of course, some code uh, pre-written here, so you don't have to watch me stumble through. Um, it's also kind of long, but we're gonna break down what this is all about, what's actually happening here. So just like you were talking about, I'm just importing. I didn't install this, right? OpenAI I just imported it here. Same for Zod. I didn't install anything, um, but I want to use this in this particular step, which we're gonna call. What are we gonna call this one? Get subject get subject and this strategy actually joel hooks uh introduced me to which was you can make a prompt to the open ai apis and then kind of validates its response as we know like sometimes you don't necessarily get back what you were expecting uh, but if you use zod as you might with other third party apis you can sort of define what you're expecting to receive as a response and then run your response through to validate that it actually does match what you're expecting. And if not, you can throw an error um, and handle that accordingly. So in this case, we have this, uh, this response. We got an OK error in a subject. And the prompt here is kind of, <laughs> it's a little heavy handed. Uh, but what's happening here? So this, is, um, this prompt is basically telling OpenAPI that whole scenario. We have a file that's got labels. We have a sprite we have a storyboard that has images of uh, somebody is in there somewhere talking about um, something. <laughs> you know, they, there's there's uh, uh, this this whole image that has a person in it, and you are an expert, OpenAI, that can identify that there's somebody in here. And which of these three labeled people, Dave, Dar, or Dylan, the triple D threat, uh, uh, are in this video or in the sprite sheet. So there is a lot here that I sort of like, you know, set up some guardrails in place to make sure that it can do its best to detect. And by the way, like, again, I'm not entirely sure I would do this in production. I might just actually fall back to the um, 
to the pass through approach because who knows what this thing might respond with. Uh, but I tell it like, here's the response format. Here's the Zod schema. So you know exactly what I'm expecting. Here's the TypeScript definition. Let's go. So we, we initiate the library here. I'm opening that labels file from the Pipedream file store. And then I'm getting the playback ID, just like we were doing before, these, these earlier step uh, pulled from that get mux asset step. And now we're sending that API request over to OpenAI. So we're saying, let's use a vision preview model. And look, we're injecting that playback ID right here in line to this URL. And we're also sending a labels file over. So as a response, uh, then, then there, there's a prompt that goes in. Let's parse the response and make sure it gets back what we were expecting. So uh, it's pretty wild, it's pretty wild uh, code, but let's see what happens here. Well, first, I have to connect again, your API, open API account. Oh, that's yeah, right. I'll air right. you okay. for that. Yeah. So the cool thing, um, if you scroll down in, at, into your code a little bit, where, where you're defining the props, so that prop where he defined open AI, it's a, it, the type of the prop it is, is an app. So it's just asking, okay, which app should I need to render? Oh, I'm connecting to open AI. All right, let's prompt for Dave's open AI API keys. And that's how that connects back to the UI above. That's so cool. It's like, normally I'd be worried once I go into, once I drop into that escape patch, once I drop into code mode that like the platform's like, well, you're on your own, but it's nice that you still provide some like connection to the higher level APIs and interfaces and keys and everything. So that, you know, even if I'm like a, a real, you know, uh, ambitious developer who wants to like really get into depth, you still have like my back. I like that. Yeah. If you want to connect multiple apps in a single step, just make another prop like AWS prop. And then you can upload the image to S3 immediately um, within the same code step. It's really very flexible. It doesn't hold you back. That is cool that like, it's kind of hard to build an app these days without tying together a bunch of different services. So to be able to like flex when, when you do need to pull those props in or uh, you know, auth in for a specific API call on the step and easily tie all that together. Um, I guess maybe that's like the name of the company. I don't know, but pipe. <laughs> it is pretty cool to be able to pipe all that Piping, together. Yeah, pipe, pipe it all yeah. together. Um, oh, all right. So it, uh, it knows. It's, it's me. It says it's me in the storyboard. Uh, we'll see if that was a fluke or not. We're gonna keep going because we were. Uh, we got 15 minutes left. We got a lot to do. We haven't even started with the image yet. Uh, I need a new step. So first thing. Um, this is going to be all of this next stuff is also going to be custom code. So we're using the Sharp JS library today. So Sharp, if you don't know anything about it, uh, I should have brought up Sharp JS. Uh, it is a like it's called a high performance Node.js image processing library. Uh, what does that mean? You can do a lot with this. I don't even know the extent of everything that you can do with it, um, but essentially allows you to manipulate and size and draw images crop, make different changes to the color space, all kinds of different stuff. Very, very interesting library. Um, but the way that I've used it before has only ever been locally because I truly the, the concept or the thought of like setting this up in serverless environment was too scary for somebody like me. Um, and I probably ran into too many errors, but uh, I think y'all just announced that this is now supported in Pipedream. Is that like a newer feature that you guys were working on? Well, that's that's the maintainer. Uh, thanks to him, he shipped a uh, a serverless compatible binary within the package that is executable within a pipe dream workflow because it is a serverless environment. Wow. We've had to do some custom work in the past for maintaining for compatibility with uh, Puppeteer and Playwright, for example, that ship with a Chromium binary. So we made our own package that's compatible with Pipe Dream. And you can use Puppeteer and Playwright with that special package with those included binaries. But luckily for us, uh, Sharp shipped a brand new version that includes this. Um, it's just really neat. In the future, this new version of Sharp is a dependency. It already is a dependency on Transformers.js, which is a uh, it's a hugging face library. Well, it's inspired by a hugging face library to run open AI, uh, open models locally, and that will be compatible with PipeDream as soon as they upgrade to the latest version of Sharp too. So that's going to be really exciting to run AI models without contacting a third-party API and paying for their usage, et cetera. 
Gosh, this is all just moving faster than I can keep up with. (laughs) I feel yeah, uh, it's wild. I I still got to even play with Transformers. I'm sure there's a whole other stream we can come up with on that one. Um, Anyway, all right. So here we have some custom code. Uh, Again, I I wrote this so I don't run into too many stumbling blocks here, but we're just importing that Sharp library here, and we're also importing this stream promises as part of pipe stream. Or what? What exactly was this part, Dylan? No, so that's that's a built-in uh, into the language. Uh, so th- this, a stream is just a native concept for um, Node.js, where you can not instead of downloading an entire file to manipulate it, you can operate on it in, in a buffer, and as it you know as it comes, uh, just better for memory, better for performance, especially when you're in a serverless environment where you're constrained on the amount of time you have. I mean, uh, lambdas can only run for twelve and a half minutes for now. Probably will change in the future, but. Uh, you have to be cognizant of the the timeouts there. Gotcha. So this is a node built in. I see. So uh, what it's giving us the ability to do. So I'm using that down here in this function. But let's like let's just walk through here's what's happening. So we have again. I'm using the playback ID that we got from the Mux asset earlier in that step. Right. And we're we're kind of constructing this URL, and this is uh, throwing that playback ID very similar to the text track that we built out. But we have this, this is at the end here. We have thumbnail.pmg, and I have a width, a modifier to say, hey, I only need a width of 320. And I'm intentionally kind of keeping these thumbnails small um, because, well, they really don't appear that all that large when you're looking at the YouTube sidebar. If you want to send it an email, it's probably good to have a smaller image. But uh, I think the only thing that was restricting you from wanting to, or to being able to um, use a larger image would be memory. As far as I know, uh, maybe you could like up, up your memory on your instance, but we're just gonna keep it small here for now. We're gonna do a three twenty oh, output. Yeah. yeah, you can you can upgrade the memory to like five gigs or something crazy if you look at the settings of the oh, okay. workflow. Yeah, 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 yeah. Maybe we'll do a four K one next time around. But uh, so we have uh, upload the image to the file source. So we're gonna basically grab this image, and this is going to give us a thumbnail from the video with the playback ID that we're using, and pull it right out from the center, uh, right in the middle of that video. So if your video is a minute, it'll give you the the 30 second mark thumbnail um, for that video. So we're going to grab that video from that URL and then Sharp will work with these buffers as we were talking about that make it easy to kind of pass that file data back and forth uh, between steps. So we have that thumbnail in place. We're going to call that the background. And then we have this other file that I prepped for window.png. And all it is is a screenshot of a VS Code window. Uh, there's got an alpha channel on the side, but I just did this straight from the, I think maybe I use clean shot for this one, but there's, there's just a, just a basic screenshot resize down, um, use in our composition. So I'm going to use that window file and basically put them both together. Right. So we have sharp, I'm calling, giving it the background, which was that original frame that we're pulling from the video. I'm going to resize it. This was just to be safe. I think we should already be getting a 320 by 180, but this is just like kind of confirm the canvas there and composite the VS code window on top at the top left, right? Uh, and then after that... And that just overlays that, the images? That's that what that, do, that does? That's it all it's doing. Yep. them together? Passing this to Sharp, cool. and this is kind of like the base layer, and then compositing right on top this VS code window, and it's starting from the top left of that frame, that 320 by 180, uh, with basically you know no movement. Um, so right in the corner. Then we're writing that file. The result of that file um, is what we want to have happen. And here is where that's actually coming together. That pipeline of wait on that composite stream to to finish, and then send it to the right stream, which will save it to the to the file store. So let's click not test quite, on that. not quite. Sorry, bud. <laughs> oh, I missed something. What is it? No, no. I mean, it doesn't wait for both to complete. It does it in real time. That's the power of it. It's it's writing and uploading at the same exact time with a buffer. So yeah, it's, that's, the... that's how you save uh, the perform. Like that's why it's full performant. You're not waiting for the whole file to complete. It's uh, sharp doing its thing and then uploading. It's happening in sequence. Buffers and streams are clearly a mystery to me and how that works. Darius, yeah. are, are you following? Buffers and streams are clearly a mystery to me too. <laughs> All I know is it yeah, works. Like, uh, All right, so we have, yeah, we it, have it is a, crazy. This get URL. So we just took the still frame from the middle of that video and we overlaid that 
VS Code window right on top. Of it. That's the result here. That's so awesome. Passing that, uh, and we got to keep going here. So we got another overlay subject, right? So we got some custom code. I'm going to grab it over here since we're running a little low on time. Paste it in here. But we can step through it very similar. So we're using the same approach as we were before. But we pass the result. Look here. I was returning the thumbnail. And sort of like wrapped it up in this nice like pre-rendered sort of object here that can be then sent between steps. Is that, am I explaining that one correctly? Oh, yeah, definitely. So that's why um, it's able to be used in the next downstream step is because it's serialized with that type. Uh, it's a pipe dream project file and that instructs pipe dream. Okay. Re rehydrate this as a file instance with those nice kind of helper methods of to buffer to write stream from URL uh, to URL. Even, you can even download it locally. That's the temp directory for local manipulation. Y'all have thought of everything. <laughs> It yeah. truly did feel yeah. like I would just run into something and ask a question and be like, oh, oh, wait, you can't do that with just like a method or like just how I would think or like return an image. I thought that was pretty cool. Um, but we have to, all right, so we got the background. Again, I'm getting the return value here and I'm saying to buffer. Then we got the name. And this is the, remember the name that was returned from OpenAI that says who is in this video? So we have Dave as the result and the subject is that actual string. And now I'm opening that file. And I'm opening from the file store, passing it in as a variable here because we're assuming it could have been somebody else, right? So if we wanted to have that dynamic part of this whole pipeline, we would have to be able to detect R or detect Dylan and then swap that in, that person in as a subject. So we would pull a still frame from the middle of their video, overlay that video code window, and then here we're going to try to grab the subject. Uh, so here's that composition of that person, right? We're sending the subject through Sharp. We're going to double check that there's an alpha channel on it, which is that transparency that kind of surrounds the, the person, right? Um, mm -hmm. As we kind of look here, we, wanted, we want to still see things that show behind the shoulder. Um, and we're resizing it. There's this helper method to just make sure that we're not going to escape from the frame too much. And we're going to call that to a buffer. So we got the person showing up. Uh, we got, this is the same thing, truly. I'm sending the subject again, but look here on the comp. I wanted this white stroke. We see that effect a lot, right? So we, we want to make sure that we separate this person from the background. Um, and the way that I came up with to do that was the exact same, except resize it to be just a little bit bigger and change the modulation. So the brightness of this image is 100%. So it just blasts it out and turns it entirely white. So we're offsetting that background just a little bit blast it out so it's entirely white. And then here we compose the two, just like we did before. There's this gravity method that pulls everything down to the southeast corner of the comp, or the, think about the, that's the bottom right corner of the comp. And then do what we did before, uh, write it and compose it and write it and then return it so we can use it again in the next step. So I'm gonna hit test here. I gotta say, Dave, that is an impressive amount of knowledge on how these visual libraries work. I mean, understanding the text to how it re results visually, that is crazy. <laughs> I don't understand that. Not uh, at all. This, it, it, there's a little bit of playing around with, look at this. This is a that's goofy, cool. Goofy. It's looking good. Yeah, um, that stroke effect is clever. That looks good. Yeah. I might be a little bit too far to the center on this one. So I could like, man <laughs> I also stretching man southeast a little bit. Yeah, yeah, like you could, you could definitely crop that. Like there's probably some imagery or some like pixels that are invisible over here that I could crop and pull myself over further to the right. Um, or you could just manually position yourself too. So you could say like, hey, I want it to be 200 pixels exactly from the left side of the frame. Uh, but this was a picture. Dylan, you're a great photographer. I don't know if I would recommend it full time, <laughs> but uh, this is that's me, uh, whether I like it or not. And um, All credit goes to clean shot. But the, um, <laughs> the project that store, I think, did we show the file store with the updated images in there? Make sure, uh, just showing that they're they're there. Yeah, the Dar, mm -hmm. Dave, and Dylan. That's where it came that's from. Right. I uploaded those yeah, while Dave was getting this together. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he's a man. He was doing he some back, background magic there. Um, all right, so we have most of this coming together. The last missing piece is this title, right? Well, we got to take the title that came from OpenAI, 
or not the title, I guess they were calling it the description text, right? For what the contents of this video are. Uh, grab the, I didn't rename this one to overlay subject. Then here we want to grab that, uh, again, that background that was generated in the previous step and passed as the return value. Here we're opening that font file we talked about before. And we're going to just write it to the temp directory, which is kind of the low execution of this particular step, right? We're grabbing the headline that was returned before trim videos fast with Mux video API. And I'm just running this little replace method that gets rid of the quotes. So we don't have any of those showing up in that final headline, right? So here Sharp's also got this cool method for add text that will allow you to pass some special looking markup that kind of looks like HTML. It's not quite HTML, but um, we have a span here, color white, we're up making an uppercase transform bold. And then that headline gets injected right in there and some additional props that we're setting for font file and how, how big we want it to appear basically. Um, everything else from there is the same deal. So we have sharp composite, the, the take the background, put the title on top from the top 25, uh, 25 pixels from the top and 20 from the left, write it to this file and return it again. So let's hit test here and see what we come up with. So you mentioned that there's a uh, pseudo HTML. Oh, you, I think you renamed the step before. Uh, the one above, you renamed it so it's just to be retested. You see a little oh, uh, warning right. icon? Yeah, that's it's a right, common yeah. uh, gotcha but it's easy to fix just retesting it. So now it has go. the proper name and hopefully this will be fixed. Cool. Um, you mentioned like pseudo HTML. So so Sharp supports like a subset of HTML that you can use, just not all of it. Yeah, it's I think it's called like Pango or something like that. Actually, here I have a link handy. It's Pango markup. Um, kind of interesting where you could like pass, hmm. there's some HTML elements. Some of them these are like, like old school markup, like XML type markup that allow you to basically control what that text ends up looking like at the end of it all. And here's some convenience tags. Like I said, it will apply like a bold if you want to use a V tag or, uh, you know, make it sm a small or amount of space, that kind of thing. So it's not quite HTML, uh, but it kind of looks like it uh, depending on how, huh. how much you squint. Never heard of it. It's cool. So here's what we came up with. Uh, again, I probably need to bump myself over just a little bit here, but it's not too, actually, I wonder if I could pull that off quick enough. That's not too far away from what we started with over here, right? Transform videos and trim videos fast with the Mux <laughs> API. So That's here's so what weird. I really wanted to try to do. Uh, we have just a minute here, was swap out the um, asset ID. So if we go back to the original trigger, and generate a test event. But instead of using an asset ID for my video, maybe I could use, should we do Dylan's or Dar's? Let's do, and we'll see if we could do both. We'll start with Dar's here. And here's an asset ID that it contains a tutorial that Darius did. Um, so we'll see if we could just run this entire pipeline against Darius's asset ID. So this would send a, again, when Darius uploads that video, send that track over and uh, then we can run this entire pipeline off of the same the same steps we just built. So I'm going to hit test workflow here. And hopefully we don't run into any sort of issues. There's a lot that's happening in a short amount of time that I didn't entirely optimize. And we'll find out what happens here. Yeah, hopefully. But the nice thing is it's really, as you saw, it's really cool, easy to iterate from a single test event with a single step um, and make changes on the go. Um, one of the neat things too is when you deploy this, uh, you can build from an old event in the past. So say you saw an error two days ago, you can build from that event and you have the exact state from that event data to build from and, and diagnose and troubleshoot. You know what this reminds me a lot of? It reminds me of like back a few lives ago, I was in research and I was doing a lot of work in like iPython notebook, which mm. like the whole point of that 
is that you know it's researchers doing the work not like computer scientists or anything so they don't want to deal with all this boilerplate or like actually really understanding what's going on uh, they just want to get the work done so like being able to replicate like step by step save various steps have like a really nice format that you can share in a programming language that you understand or maybe even like visual programming like it's a really nice interface and like i kind of miss it and i'm kind of glad that it's back even though like i do real computer things now i I, I like this. This is good. Jupyter notebooks Dark. are real. Definitely. I was really happy Jupyter with notebook. your result. That's right. I'm going to run one more with Dylan. So we come up with here. But yeah, I think the only thing I would really change here is maybe that cropping on the right hand side, which really is not not too terrible. But it would you of the overlaying kind of like weigh out that composition a little bit, a little bit better. So here, let's see what I came up with Dylan's for as well. Copy and value. it saves you and like also standardizes your thumbnails too. If you have a certain theme, you don't have to go out and boot up mm -hmm. Photoshop and make sure it's exactly the same font for every single machine that's opening it. Yada yada. It's nice and standardized. Oh, look at that. Look at that mug. Pretty sweet. Same, same deal. I would just bump <laughs> over. Like we could probably even tweak that, but bump over just a little bit. And yeah, that's looking pretty good here. So this, uh, oh, and then the, the last part that's worth mentioning here is that the pre-processing that happened with that screenshot, we use a service to remove the background of our screenshot. Obviously I have a background behind me um, that just like, I don't know, man, the robots are taking over. It can just erase the background from your screenshot or from your photo and replace it with that alpha channel, that transparency that we're looking for. So Dylan ran that process, um, which is literally like upload, drag and drop to a website and where it was able to kind of prep these files. Uh, so it's pretty sweet. Yeah. In the two hour version, we'd show you how to use it, their API as to programmatically remove the background, but uh, we already expired our hour. <laughs> yeah, that was a lot, man. I feel like I just was speed running right there for a minute, but um, yeah. I, honestly, I could see a production workflow where something like this comes together. At least, you know, maybe it doesn't update your YouTube video automatically. Maybe you don't feel comfortable with it. But if you were to run this in a pipeline that says, hey, can you at least like run this pipeline and send me an email with all the attachments and will give me some options to choose from, you can see how you could like tie together all these different services um, and come up with some interesting stuff. It's pretty cool. Man. Yeah. Definitely. What a great thumbnail. I get the million views that I'm looking for is the real question. You guys don't seem very optimistic. I'm too polite to answer that. I believe. I believe. With that kind of reaction. <laughs> you know, with Plus that. Plus it's the Mux video API. With that. <laughs>